Welcome to Short and to the Point, a podcast from the comeback in awful announcing. Here's your host, Jessica Kleinschmidt. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Short and to the Point. Jess Kleinschmidt here for the Comeback and Awful Announcing. Short and to the Point, a sports podcast. It's football time. We're in the playoffs. We're heading toward the big game. A girlfriend of mine just texted me the other day saying, what are our Super Bowl plans? I don't know. It's always dependent upon the teams involved. But today we do have an NFL podcast. I'm excited for my guests, Ryan Jensen and Garrett Gilkey. Garrett Gilkey is a former NFL guard for the Tampa Bay Bucks. Ryan Jensen, you might know him. He's one of the best to ever do it. A center for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Spent many years there. He got drafted by the Baltimore Ravens. They're working on this new business venture. It's not super new, but it's really exciting called Gilk. We get into that a little bit more as the conversation continues. What we also get into, and it's something that I'm very, very passionate about, and that's mental health. I struggle with mental health. I'm an overthinker. Thank you very much. Which turn into panic attacks which I have medication for, and they they can be debilitating. So I think mental health is very important to talk about. And I'm glad that they were here to talk about it because to go from the transition of being an NFL athlete to giving all of that up and becoming a normal person sounds simple, right? No, there's actually traumatic effects to it. And Garrett so graciously opens up about it. We also, of course, do talk about the fact that Ryan Jensen did play and did guard the GOAT, Tom Brady, and then many more subjects, including Dave Canales, who is now the newly appointed Panthers head coach. So without further ado, here is my amazing conversation with Garrett Gilkey and Ryan Jensen. I told y'all Ryan and Garrett would be here and they very much are. Thank you guys so much. I think this is my first interview where I have two people in one box. I appreciate y'all being here. Thanks for having us. Of course. There's a there's a lot that I want to go over. Um, it's probably one of my more favorite podcasts to research. But before we dive deep into that, what are y'all up to right now? So you have a current NFL player and a former NFL player. What are you guys both up to in this present moment? In this present moment or in our vocational world, which which present moments and realities? Do I'm the one to? asking the questions, Garrett, but let's <laughs> do let's do both. Let's do both. So at the present moment, um, we are enjoying a, a great day here in Tampa, Florida um, at Gilk headquarters uh, in Ybor. Um, and uh, we're also in the journey of growing the firm. And, and we're really spending a lot of time and energy and focus on our brand development. Our chief growth officer, Tony, has done an amazing job. And we've, uh, we've just been walking out this amazing journey of using, um, using this firm to, uh, to really expand into some other marketplaces and create more market opportunities and, and overall just kind of grow and, and expand. So it's been really great. Ryan, yeah. tell me more about that. Yeah, definitely. No, it's been a it's been a fun fun journey this far. You know, I joined uh, Gilk uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Uh, me and Garrett have been uh, friends for over ten years. Actually, competed against each other in college. Both got drafted in the NFL in the same year uh, to competing uh, conference or competing teams in the conference. Uh, he got drafted to Cleveland. Uh, me to Baltimore. So, um, but yeah, like currently, you know, like like Garrett mentioned, we're just in the process of really expanding this this business out and. Uh, you know, really moving forward. And you mentioned the business. I did a little bit of research on it, but what's the mission and kind of what's the overall aspect for Gilk? So the the <clears throat> mission of, of Gilk is um, building dreams and transforming lives. So when I got hurt in the NFL, um, I immediately got my master's degree in engineering, started my MBA, got my GC license, my plumbing license, and started a company here in Tampa. I was super proactive in the community with several ministries, Abram Ministries, Created, um, and Timothy Initiative. And out of the kind of a, the journey of my exodus from the NFL came the origination of Gilk. And, and so our whole mission and vision is building dreams, transforming lives as we live in some really, really cool local partnerships and, and relationships, but also as we live into um, what now is becoming something we're taking more ownership over, which is the brand image of the NFL and the relationships that 
we both have fostered for the last, you know, 10, 11 years in our worlds, um, you know, and dovetailing all of that into the continuation of this really, really cool design build firm that designs and builds some really cool custom homes. Um, and also, you know, we do some development opportunities as well. And so we're just kind of walking that whole journey out. And so it's, but the whole premise is living in the, the ability to create and build people's dreams and really living in the relational journey of walking with people as people live in transformation and experience transition. When it comes to being, you know, transitioning, why is that an important message for you? Because I feel like as a former athlete or a current athlete, you're constantly transitioning, whether it's retiring or not, or injuries, or just like changing the game, all of that. Why is the transitional phase of this important? Yeah, you know, the transition from, you know, one high thing to another, or really any life transition at, at all, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with that. Um, I think a unique thing with a lot of NFL players is, you know, you're at the top of a mountain, you work your entire life to get into the NFL, get to whatever, you know, high performance thing that you're doing. And then when that transition, you know, that that journey ends, that, that chapter's over with, there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with that. And it freaks people out, you know, for the longest time, you know, like athletes were put on this, this mountain, this pedestal of, you know, we're kind of, you know, almost gods to an extent. And as soon as, you know, you're kind of out of the NFL, unless you're, you know, a certain type of player that continues and, you know, has a, you know, a, a generational legacy, you know, you kind of fall off that mountain and, and you're no longer one of those, those gods. And a lot of times uh, people freak out over that and they don't know what's next. They feel like they hit the pinnacle of their life already. So for us to get, you know, out of that and kind of break that narrative of that, you know, our life's over at 32, 33 years old, whenever that happens, you know, we got 60 more years we got to live. And that's like the biggest thing, you know, uh, you know, Garrett walked that out uh, quite a bit earlier in his career than me. But, you know, be, me being my later years of my career, uh, you know, using Garrett as a uh, you know, mentor through that process has been has been huge. And that's kind of what we want to uh, bring to people from, you know, that mental health st standpoint of, of, you know, it's not over. There's there's 60 more years of your life that you have uh, to excel at something else. Gosh willing, right? And Garrett, when it comes to you make the decision that you're no longer going to lace up, you're never no longer going to play in the NFL. What was that mental state like for you to come to that decision? I mean, we can have a whole other hour long sidebar conversation. I mean, it's, yeah. it's devastation. You know, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's one of the you know, it's one of the hardest traumas that I've ever had to walk through and live in. You know, you're when you live in vision, you know, when you live in perspective, when you live in assumptions, which everybody does. And then in a moment, your entire framework of reality and purpose and identity and, and opportunity and lifestyle are taken away from you. Um, it is it's a big T trauma that isn't talked about. Um, and discussed and probably supported for a lot of guys, you know, and so conversations are had around, Hey, always make sure you have a secondary tertiary plan. Um, but no one really can prepare you for again, life's big T traumas and, and challenges. So for me, it was a, you know, something that was extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and it still is difficult, you know, and I've been, I was, I happened to have a very successful career in the NFL ended by an injury then have had a very successful first kind of half of my business life journey. And then have come down from that. And now we're on this third approach of growing the company and taking it further, you know? And so at every season of life, those unresolved challenges, those past traumas, those past wounds, those past difficulties, those past challenges, all of it are always going to resurface as we enter into new places, you know? And so it was a, it was something that was very hard. It's still very hard. Um, you know, I'm super, super grateful that I get to do this with Ryan and I get to do this with our other executives and our team because it's also, it's a high performance environment. Mm -hmm. You know, I may not be able to live in the crazy, crazy high performance pursuit of, of, you know, an athletic career anymore, but I can live in that relationship with others in an environment that still is, you know, high stakes, high pressure, very competitive, um, you know, a need for attention to detail. Um, something that requires excellence, you know, and so it's it's this kind of journey of learning how to retool that which we already are. It's this right. journey of learning how to retool the things and the characteristics and the the gifts, the talents, the blessings that we already possess 
and retooling those in an orientation that I think allows for the journey that Ryan's speaking to, which is this journey of growth in the second half of our, you know, of our, of our, of our adult lives. You know, so often the question that I think a lot of guys wrestle with is, is in that transition, there's so much identity that's falsely placed on the journey of being an athlete and on the experience of being an athlete. And so most of the transition is one that is deeply existential, very relational, very intimate in the reforming of someone's identity into a new place. You know, so if you can detach from the ego, if you can detach from the assumptions and the, you know, all of the images of growth and success through the NFL, and you can reshape that in this new environment where you're being retooled, then you're set up to be probably more successful in that new environment than where you came from, you know, being an NFL player. You know, so I think that there's actually a, there's a, there's a misconception that are you know that the, we hit the pinnacle at 30 you know at 20 something to 30 something years old as an athlete i think that's a i think that's a, an assumption i think that's a lie that gets communicated that doesn't consider the amazing journey of transformation and transition into something that is new and something that is fresh and it's it's really interesting that you attach i'm not saying it's a term because it's definitely something you go through you casually I don't, easily said the term trauma, which I think is really cool. You can you can say it so easily. Was it easy for you to attach trauma to what you were going through? Because it's a tough word to use. So no one ever wants to acknowledge trauma, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so trauma effectively, when you study any worldview, any ancient religion, or even modern psychology or trauma philosophy, trauma affects words. Trauma affects you know affects articulation. It affects language. That's that's why um, people wrestle with the different things they wrestle with is because of the shame and the fear and the anxiety that come from the things that we've experienced. And so I knew in the moment that what I was walking through was traumatic. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know was the way in which it was going to positively or adversely affect me in the moving forward. And so it wasn't until I started living in some relational disruptions as I continue to still wrestle with those challenges that I recognize the degree in which that abrupt, um, you know, pivot in life affected me emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, um, you know, in all kind of facets of who Garrett is as a person, you know, and so it's something that we really like to embrace. It's something that we really like to bring out into the light. It's something that we really like to to encourage people in, you know, I personally believe we believe that there's a power in vulnerability. I think in the right space in the right environment, um, you know, I, I really believe that there's a strength in that. There's a there's a freedom that I think comes with the the journey of expression as it relates to the things that can be vulnerable or the things that have been traumatic, um, you know. And so I think that you know when you when you study trauma specifically with NFL players, you have this amazing correlation between those who are able to deconstruct from their egos who have been through trauma and those who can't, who find themselves stuck in a false sense of their identity for 15, 20, 30 years after they retire. You know, so the, the sooner we can embrace the reality of no longer being the God that plays on TV, the sooner we can embrace the reality of no longer being idolized and worshiped for wearing a helmet and for wearing a Jersey, mm -hmm. the I can accept the fallen nature of my reality and like pick up those pieces, retool them, and then like go do something, you know, that brings more purpose to the next half of my life. You're right. We do need more than just an hour. And I think that that's so cool. And and I'm right there with you. Vulnerability changed my life. So I'm so glad that you, that you mentioned that. Ryan, I wanted to ask you, I watched you in an interview and you were talking about the competitive nature that you're still dealing with in this next venture for you as well. And you were talking about a phone call you had. You were like on the phone. It was competitive. You can still kind of use what you, your tools that you used in the NFL, kind of what Garrett was talking on. So how have you been able to use some of that competitive nature, being able to, you know, have the excellence in what you're doing now. Yeah, definitely. I think it's just, you know, the way I'm wired is, you know, uh, to be competitive and within this, this, uh, this organization and within uh, the whole process of design build and what we're doing with the company, like you have to have that, you have to have that edge. And for me, um, you know, when I got hurt last year is when I really kind of started jumping in uh, to more of the stuff. And for me, it was a way to uh, divert my energy away from 
you know, like Garrett was just talking on that, that trauma, getting hurt and having your whole life flipped on your head. You know, you can sit there and, and wallow on in your misery and your bitterness over what happened, but it doesn't, it's not good for you and it's not good for the people around you. So the ability to me to, you know, transition that energy into a really highly competitive, uh, you know, business has been, has been great. And you talked about the injury. You were very emotional when you were talking about it. It had a lot to do with your son too, because we know like how you would bond with him over that. How were you able to, were you able to casually transition or was it, did it take some time? Because the way that you're talking about it, you're like, yeah, I just had to admit the fact that the, this is the next step, but what was that process like? Yeah, no, that was a, you know, a very vulnerable part of my life. Uh, you know, you know, it's still struggling with it to this day a little bit. Um, but yeah, like when I got hurt, you know, I remember coming in a couple of days later and I'm like, oh, I went through all the stages of grief already, you know, mm -hmm. kind of joking around about it, kind of thinking I was serious. And then uh, our, our head trainer came up to me and I was just talking to him and he's like, yeah, you, you haven't you haven't experienced anything yet. He goes, it's going to come in. It's going to come in waves with this emotional dropout and fallout from from being hurt and all this. He goes, just, you know, make sure whenever you're starting to feel those those feelings and uh you just talk about it. And, you know, I was able to talk to Garrett about that a lot. My wife, uh, you know, people within the organization. Um, so it's just, it's, you know, that, that transition, you know, it was unexpected, you know, you don't expect to ever get hurt. It's, you know, it's a re reality of what we do in the NFL. Um, you know, you just wouldn't, for me, I would never expect it to happen in, in a practice mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that. It's kind of that, I think that ego, I'd rather go down in, in battle than, yeah practice type of thing but you know that transition uh you know it was it was important to you know focus my energy on something um you know positive instead of the the negative of of me being injured so um it was definitely uh, an emotional couple months and you know it still comes in waves you know mm -hmm. watching the guys on the side from from the sideline during the this season you know it you know it's you get a little amped up you get a little angry get a little sad at times and it's uh something that you just got to work through it's something having a, a good circle around you of people that you can trust, uh, you know, be vulnerable because, you know, you can only hold that stuff in so much before it, you know, it becomes a poison to you. And, but you were able to return for one game. Did I get mm -hmm. that right? Yep. And that was, that was a big game. That was Tom Brady's final game. And you had this amazing quote saying like, I was happy to do that for him. And I feel like that's the theme when it comes to Tom, you play with him, but you also play for him. What's it like having him as your quarterback? Yeah, you know, I, I learned so much from Tom from like a leadership standpoint of things. Um, you know, his his striving for excellence and perfection, you know, nothing's ever going to be perfect, but striving for perfection is something that he always always talked about and pushed for. And he just always had a way of, of motivating guys uh, to get the best out of them. And that's something, you know, my two years that I was able to play with him, you know, two full years, uh, you know, was something that really impacted me, you know, on the football field, but also off of it. And when it comes to, you know, you being on and off the field, the term protector is used to define you a lot. And how are you able to use that both on and off the field being a protector? Yeah, definitely. So like on the field, you know, it kind of comes with the job, you know, being off the line protecting the quarterback, but also just protecting your guys, you know, with they've taken a cheap shot or something like that. Just, you know, being able to be that guy that, that has everybody's back and, uh, you know, transitioning that into, you know, the business and our philosophy is one of those things we were trying to protect our clients. We want to protect them from being, uh, you know, taken advantage of uh, in this in this world, which is uh, unfortunately something that's very easy for a lot of companies to do. And that's something we want to, you know, as our as our company, we want to be this very open book type of company where they know it, where everything is being spent money wise. But also had live in like a relational um, aspect of that, where they know we have their back no matter what. And it's, uh, I think that's something you know, me and Garrett both have strived uh, to be on the forefront of. Anytime we have a, a new client meeting, it's like, hey, we're we're he we're here to protect you through this this process, which is you know a very vulnerable uh, part of their life when you know you're you're starting a, a new build or a, um, you know fixing something up. It's uh, it's very vulnerable. And, and Garrett, well, Garrett, tell me about the transparency. Why is that important in your business ventures? Yeah, so I was on a um, I was on a trip to the Bahamas with two of my mentors when I was still playing, and I was sitting with one of them, 
and he was sharing with me the like the more of like a eternal purpose behind what he did and it was all rooted in the belief that <clears throat> he believes that he's called to shepherd his clients and be an advocate for his clients and so for me you know being you know having the exposure that i had through playing and through um and, and having the exposure i had in the business world you know exposed me to and having my experiences as a player victimized and objectified by the industry um you know ryan and i have both been objectified since we were 22 years old you know and so you know guys have so we have our own trust issues you know guys everyone in sports entertainment everyone in general has trust issues and so when when my mentor brent communicated to me and he's a super high-end home builder as well you know so he designs and builds really beautiful homes on the west coast of florida one of our now competitors um you know he just shared this philosophy and this heart orientation that was you know he believed that his calling was to stand in the forefront of the journey that is extremely volatile and extremely challenging extremely disruptive extremely threatening of his clients that he just believes is called to just protect um, yeah. and shepherd you know and so when he helped me understand that i can live in this new vocational calling and this new vocational placement in the same orientation that i have been conditioned to live in which is it is first and foremost as an offensive lineman never about you so it's never about you and it is only your contribution to everything around you that gives the guys who are going to do the work and do it well the ability to win you know and so ryan and i both don't live with i mean in everyone you know we're both human we both have our own stuff but we don't live out of a place or a posture of selfishness mm -hmm. focused um we live out of a perspective of being protectors being shepherds being advocates you know in a world in an industry where guys like us and high net worth clients um you know clients in the entertainment world clients in the professional sports world are objectified and prostituted daily you know, mm -hmm. so the entire business model that I created was one rooted in complete financial transparency. Hey, I'm an architectural builder. We are builders. We have a team of architects and designers. We are extremely gifted at what we do when it comes to actually putting out really wonderful design and then building really well. The, the conversation we have with our clients is less about whether or not we're trying to meet a specific budget for you as it is whether or not we believe we're called into relationship with one another and we can lead you through the extremely, like Ryan said, transparent processes of pre-construction, construction, owners repping and overall development, you know? And so our entire framework, our entire business model was created in an extremely transparent orientation to give, to give those in our network, to give those that we serve, to give those that we're called to, to those that we need to lead the, the, the ability to have peace and arguably the most vulnerable decisions that they ever make. So outside who you marry, what you live in and the home you build is probably one of the most vulnerable decisions you will ever make. And so having, you know, so a lot of guys and a lot of people, and again, sports entertainment, high net worth are making decisions and they don't know the industry. They have no idea how to navigate the complexities of the contractor world or the design world or how to pull true costs out of the way in which people hide the pickle in creating cost structures or cost breakdowns. It's overwhelming for people, you know? And so we, we have brothers and we have sisters in the world that we came from who have been completely objectified for years and yeah. don't know how to deal with their limited exposure to the industry and, in, in lead that with the deep challenges of not being able to trust somebody because of the way in which we're consistently constantly taken advantage of so so for us it is we are you we understand where you come from we understand what your insecurities are we understand where the vulnerabilities are and we're not here we're not here because we're we're interested in taking advantage of you financially we're here because we believe that we're called to do this you know and a, and a beautiful byproduct and function of that is growth and it is mm -hmm one winning. We're not strictly, you know, we have a lot of nonprofit functions of what we do, but we're also for profit. Right. When we, when we can communicate to a client, hey, not only are we, again, really gifted designers and can do this, we can take your entire worldview and desire for living and we can extrapolate that, put that into form and build it. And we can do it exceptionally well. We also um, can do this in a way that gives you more freedom, more control, more certainty. 
than you probably fathomed. You know, so we're just, I think, uniquely positioned to take the same characterhood of who we have always been and retool it in this now new amazing, you know, real estate submarket of design build. And you mentioned a lot of people that you know and love, especially have limited exposure, which is totally true. And I feel like it's a good mindset to have. But what have you been exposed to to know that this could go south? Because when it comes to that, I watch HGTV, but I don't know what's happening behind the scenes. So what are you what did you ever notice where they weren't upfront about some of the costs of these projects? Constantly. You know, Ryan can speak to this too. From the moment I was 22 years old, I had people give me false financial information related to scopes of work that didn't make any sense. You know, so having a master's degree in engineering and then, you know, having the experience I have with the background I have being an athlete, you know, I I know I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I also can live in some degree of discernment when you give me a you know, when you give me a $25,000 quote to install six cabinets in the kitchen. Yeah. So, so living with that, you know, so maybe there's some hypervigilance there. Sure. Mm -hmm. some trauma for me to work through. I also think that it's a unique, there's been a gifting of that too, because now we, Ryan and I both live in a pretty deep degree of discernment as it relates to what's true and what's false. Um, you know, Ryan's had some crazy experiences with that as well. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, it actually was a, a construction. Uh, I was doing an addition on my house in Colorado. This is before, you know, I kind of brought Garrett into the, this was four or five years ago now. And, you know, looking back on it, I, I just didn't know any better. And, you know, I ended up getting charged half a million dollars for a project that probably should have been half of that. Wow. And, you know, it's one of those things you you learn as you go and, and having somebody around you like Garrett, um, you know, especially, uh, more recently, uh, I've acquired some land in Colorado and, you know, like, like Gary mentioned, like I'm, I'm smart, but I'm not always the smartest guy in the room. And so I called him to ask for advice on the uh, acquisition of this land. And, you know, we had this brief contract that I had signed or I hadn't signed it yet, but we're going over with, um, buying this property and there's just stuff in there, you know, terminology that I didn't really know what was happening, you know, to an extent I could just, it felt fishy, but I just wasn't sure what was fishy about it. You know, I brought him out and he kind of went through it and he goes, yeah, it's like this, this, and this is, he's trying to, he's trying to pull the wool over your eyes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And being able to, uh, you know, take that apart from that level in, and going, oh, okay, now I see it. I think it's a, just an education thing. You know, there's so many guys who, you know, are in my position who, you know, have been successful in the NFL, made a bunch of money and they don't really care. They're like, oh, they'll just blindly write a check. And I think that's something when we try to shepherd our clients through, it's like, no, like they're, they're hiding this information on purpose. So you don't really, you know, look at it that, you know, hoping you'll just kind of skim over it and sign the check. And that's something I think we've really done uh, very well with all of our clients is being, you know, transparent and having that upfront you know, the, the loaf of bread is going to cost what the loaf of bread costs. Right. And, you know, when you start seeing these kind of strange numbers in some of these different, you know, projects or whatever uh, from a different company or, or however you want to look at it, you know, there's something probably fishy about what that is if the, if the loaf of bread's costing 3x what the, the loaf of bread actually is supposed to cost. And it's interesting because when I think of, or not me, just because I've, I've worked with athletes for a while, but when you think of athletes from an outside perspective, vulnerability or being taken advantage of doesn't exactly come to mind, but it's almost like times 10 because you guys have so much money so quickly and you could easily attach that to like, oh, well, they've got money. They can, they can just do it. Right. The, the dichotomy of our lives is for always the learning how to live confidently in that truth. Just because, you know, I benched 500 pounds and played in the NFL and Ryan is one of the best who has ever done it doesn't mean that we're any more or less at risk than anyone else. In fact, in the business world and in the financial world and in the real estate world, we're probably more at risk than most because there are functions of who we are that weren't ever forced to deal with and or um, organically grow in perspective like others who haven't experienced the rapid, you know, success rates that we've experienced, you know, and so we're, you know, we're there. The reality is, is we live in a world where people are constantly trying to take advantage of others. Very, very few people live in an outward expression of their lives. 
and we are seen as objects, as resources, as people to be taken advantage of. You know, and so, oh, you're just a big dumb football player. Well, um, no, that's not true. You know, and so, you know, it is something that, you know, is a big part of Ryan and I's personal journey is, again, kind of goes back to that, you know, strength and vulnerability and being like being okay, not having to live into the false images that are only assigned to us as gladiators, NFL players, offensive linemen. You know, and you think about it, most of the images assigned to an offensive lineman or an NFL player are big, dumb, brute men. Well, we're ex we're super, you know, empathetic. We're very intuitive, and we're sensitive people, just like anyone else. You know, and so we we like to live with. I know for me, I really like to live with that as a strength. You know, in the moving forward, when we build relationships and we connect with people and we try to empower others. You know, because it, you know, I think there's a there's a strength and there's a safety and there's an empowerment that's found in the lives of the people we come across when they recognize that, you know, we're not, we're like, we're so much more than guys that wore helmets. You know, we're so much more than guys who just played on a field. And, you know, there's all of these other dynamics of who we are. And we use those different dynamics to really lead this business in a way that's been pretty, pretty powerful. What was the first time that you saw the stereotype of somebody referring to you as a, a big, dumb football player? <laughs> I mean, I feel like I got it from being in high school, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just something you live with. That's something that, you know, I mean, when you're in high school, you don't know. No one knows who they are. When you're in college, no one knows who they are. In the young adult world, everyone's trying to figure out themselves. And even when you have kids and you have a family, you're just trying to survive, you know, so you know, I, I chalk it up to people don't know what they're doing most of the time, you know, and so it's okay. I, I'm fine with the perceptions of others. I'm fine with the mis, you know, the misconceptions of others because it just gives, it gives us the opportunity to prove people wrong. You know, it gives us the opportunity to go like, oh no, like, you know, I have read a few books, you know, and we are educated, <laughs> you know, and we do know what we talk, we're talking about and we do have vision and we do have integrity and we do have substance. You know, and we're very, very multidimensional and that makes us dynamic people to be around, you know, and so it's a it's a it's a safety, too, because if that's the if that's the framework you're going to see us, you're probably not going to be in connection with us very long, you know, and so if if you can't get past those assumptions that you carry with you um, that honestly separate you from us, that's that's on you. That's your issue. Ryan, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think Garrett kind of hit the nail on the head right there. Um, you know, it's just a, a, you know, kind of that stereotype you live with as a, as a football player, as an athlete. A lot of times, you know, you're in high school and if you're an athlete, everybody calls you a, just a you know, dumb jock. And mm -hmm. for me, like it never really, never really bugged me at all. It just is what it is. Um, but it's just, you know, like like Garrett mentioned, there's so much more to us than just sports and football you know we have we have lives and uh you know it's just a job you know people always ask me like how cool is it to be an nfl player and you know play football and do all this i'm like yeah it's it's cool you know in, in society's eyes but at the end of the day I, like i come home from work and it's just like you complain about work everybody does it that's the way it is and you know obviously really fortunate to you know play at this high of a level and and you know be awarded the opportunities you know, from a financial standpoint and from, you know, a, a quote unquote fame standpoint. But a lot of times for me, like I just wanted to go to work and come home and, and be a dad, like, you know, not bring my work home with me all the time. And, um, you know, that's that's something that you figure out throughout your career. You know, for for me and Garrett, we we're both Division two athletes, never really had an exposure to that to that fame. You know, we'd be lucky if we had 400 people in the stands. Yeah. Uh, at our games and then all of a sudden you're you're thrusted into this position of you know millions of people watching you every weekend you know it, it can be a little bit of a, a like mind it messes with your mind a little bit and i think everybody goes through and figures out how that's going to affect them and you know early on in my career you know i was so you know like i was i was excited because i was in the nfl but also for me my mindset was always like i don't want to lose this I don't want to lose this opportunity. You know, I've been granted this, this wonderful opportunity. Like I'm going to do everything I can to get most, get the most out of that, uh, that chance and that opportunity. So for me, it just, you know, kind of going throughout the day, going throughout the years, the seasons is always figuring out how 
to stay in, but stay in at a high level. And, and Garrett kind of said it too, you're one of the best to ever do it. And it feels like that's a very, very much something that people define you as, but you're very humble about it all. I, the easiest way to ask this is like, why aren't you an asshole? <laughs> you know, I think, I think for me, like <laughs> one of the, one of the things that I actually found out uh, when I got hurt was kind of how important I was actually to the organization, to the to Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know, for me, I was just, I'm just kind of a lunch bell guy. Go to work, do my thing, you know, go hit people, go throw people on the ground. Mm -hmm. you know, I do that in my job too. I get it. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, you know, I, I, I didn't fully understand my impact that I had in the organization um, through what I did as a, as a football player. You know, I think that just comes from me coming from, you know, kind of humble beginnings and and working my way to the top you know i was a, a six round draft pick you know i had to work for everything mm -hmm. um you know my first four years in the league i was just trying to stay in you know i started a couple games but you know i didn't become a full-time starter until my fifth year in the league and then signed down here in tampa after that year and for me it was just go to work like just go work because like i i, I knew i was good at football like you know i didn't really understand the the full impact that I had, you know, from a organization wide until I really got hurt. And I remember walking out of the training room, you know, in one of my most vulnerable positions I've been in, in my career on crutches, can't walk. And I just remember, you know, making eye contact with, with Jason light, you know, the whole front office ownership was standing outside the doctor's office, waiting for me to come out, you know, hoping for good news. And I just remember locking eyes with Jason, and I'm like, I'm getting emotional talking about it right now, mm -hmm. but um, just like locking eyes with him and just feeling the weight of me getting hurt. Like it all just like I felt that hit me like, OK, like this is actually a, a really devastating blow to the to the team. And, you know, gave him a big old hug and, you know, just kind of, you know, went on about my day to go get my MRIs done and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it's just something for me. It was. You know, you know, Garrett says, oh, you're one of the best to ever do it. I just I don't see myself that way. It's just I just see myself as a as a, a guy who would go put it, everything on the line for the guys next to him and, and my team, because that's all I knew. You know, as we talked about it earlier, kind of being that that protector, like that was what I did. Like I at that time, it was one of those things where. You know, I kind of solely identified as a football player mm. and you know, once that, once I got injured, it kind of really opened up my eyes to saying like, oh, like, you know, yeah, you're a football player, but there's actually a lot more to you, you know, whether it's within the organization of Tampa Bay Bucks, but at home and, and with friendships and stuff like that. So it was, it was a really, you know, we, we talked about trauma, like it was one of those traumatic events that a lot of past traumas crept into that part of my, my journey at, at that point that really let me you know, help deconstruct a lot of my past traumas, not even the injury, but things before that and really figure out myself. It was a, it was a really great time for self-reflection. Um, it was one, one of those, like almost those like signs, like, Hey, you need to slow down and, and really, yeah. and really figure some stuff out. And, you know, it was one of those blessings in disguise. That's for sure. Well, and it kind of sounds like obviously I wasn't there, but when you have a member of the front office who genuinely cares about you, it didn't look like you were a transaction at that point. It exactly. felt like he genuinely cared about you. And that's that's rare when it comes to those types of positions. So that's really good to hear. 100%. Yeah. And and on that note, you know, can you guys both try to describe like what the Buccaneers organization means to you overall and kind of what people who don't play or are associated with the organization, if you're a casual NFL fan, what would you like them to know about this organization? Yeah, I think for me, for my like personal experience with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and, and everything like that, like, like I had mentioned, um, you know, they, they changed my life, mm -hmm. obviously, um, from a financial standpoint. Um, you know, after my first year being a full-time starter uh, with, with, with the Ravens and, uh, 2017, you know, I, they, I came down here after one year of, of again, I, I knew I was pretty good, but then they made me the highest paid center in history of the NFL after one season of starting like that, you know, obviously life changing stuff there. But after 
after that, you know, it's coming into work every day and the family kind of orientation that they, they live within, you know, from the front office down, you know, I hear horror stories, obviously I've only been with, with two teams, but you know, you hear a lot of stories of front office, um, people in other organizations that aren't personal with their players. Mm -hmm. They, like you mentioned, they kind of treat us like transactions, which I understand from a business aspect of things. Yeah. Uh, definitely Tampa for, for me was a very personal and, and they wanted to get to know us, but not only us, but our families and what we're doing with, with everything. So that was, a uh, for me, that transition of, of moving from Baltimore where I played for five years down to Tampa, you know, that's a huge life transition and for them to be, you know, kind of as opened arms as they were, was, was really refreshing. And Garrett during your three cups of coffee in the NFL. I mean, you know, what's what's cool is to to be able to go from, you know, immature perspective to like deep, deep understandings of gratitude and thankfulness. You know, I mean, I am forever thankful for my time in Tampa and for my time with the Buccaneers and for what I learned through the through that entire experience and thankful for my time with the Browns and being drafted in Cleveland, um, you know, the it's we, we Ryan further than me, but like, you know, best and the best in the world at what we did, you know, and so it's it's a beautiful it's beautiful to be able to and, you know, just to be able to have the confidence of the experiences of that give us the ability to continue to move forward. You know, so mm -hmm. we will forever be blessed by the images that are behind us and what we've experienced and what we've achieved and where we've been through and what we what we've played through, you know, and so. Um, to me, it's just a testament of the continued move forward. You know, it's like life is life is a journey. The question is, is when do you wake up to it and mm -hmm. live well with it? You know, and so all of my experiences in Tampa are the continued encouragement to continue to move forward and to continue to go and to continue to go and to continue to go. You know, and so, yeah, nothing but just like thankfulness and appreciation for the, the whole spectrum of it. Um, I only have two more questions, one for each of you. I swear I, I just I could talk to y'all forever. But um, my my main job is I'm the Oakland A's team reporter and one of their broadcasters. And we had Trevor May land on the IL last year for anxiety. And it was definitely something that I hadn't really covered throughout my five or six years in the industry. And Mark Kotze, my manager who played, you know, 90s, 2000s, it was unheard of for him too. So Garrett, what's it like hearing that professional sports are embracing mental health and there's not a stigma and you can like walk in the manager's office and talk to him about it? Yeah, I mean, I um, I wish more guys would take advantage of it from a pre proactive, preventative point of view. Um, every single person who experiences high level athletics is going to need some degree of counseling some degree of therapy some degree of something you know and so you know if and and then furthermore i think also this statistic probably exists somewhere um most people who experience success at that level have something something off like you know yeah. like you don't pursue excellence in one thing with that degree of repetition that commitment for that many years unless there's like a little bit of something that maybe is like out of balance and so it's this double-edged sword of the thing that is a challenge is also the thing that makes you great right it's like these dual kind of truths you know and so i i love it i think it's amazing you know, I wish more guys would open up. I wish more guys would go back to things and uncover and work through. You know, I think the sooner people figure out how to deal with where they come from and what they're struggling with and where they want to go, which is a just a, like a life coaching conversation, the sooner they, our, we will see our teams become more successful, the sooner we will see guys have healthier lives after their careers are over. You know, I think it's something that we need to continue to hit home now because the way in which we're probably, and this is again, this is not a and this is really an invitation, Jessica, for more conversation right now, but maybe later. You know, but the way He's like, you don't have to talk more, but I'm gonna talk more. I'm right there with you on the board. All of the uh, you know, all of the ways in which we're paying college athletes now is just bringing closer into adolescent development. Um you know, adolescent development, the, the issues that really are should be reserved for people who are fully mature, have fully mature brains, 
you know? So I think that it's an, it's something we need to continue to encourage because we need it, you know? And so whether you're an athlete or you're just a civilian, I personally believe that we always need mentors. We always need counselors. We always need therapists. We always need people who can help us in the journey of our lives. And so, yeah, I mean, I think we need to embrace it. I think we need to encourage it. And I think the sooner we all wake up to like, Hey, we all kind of need some help walking this thing off, you know, called life out, you know, the better. I agree. And Ryan, last one, did you have a lot of exposure to Canalis at all? Yeah, I did. So uh, throughout the, throughout the year, um, you know, I was, helping coach. I, I, I use coach as a loose term because that, that life's not for me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, no, I love Dave. Dave is a, is a great man. Um, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, he's actually renting out Garrett's house here in Tampa. So Garrett's going to have to figure out uh, a new uh, a new tenant here before too long. But I was going to say, like, I know it's just a report, but what like characteristics does he possess that would make him a good head coach? I mean, his leadership, um, you know, the first time I met Dave, I was a little unsure of him. You know, he's first time being an offensive coordinator, uh, was just so, such a like happy go lucky guy. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, let's see how this is going to work out. But when it comes down to like the root thing, like he's such a, a, a man of relation, like he wants to have relationships with all of his players and, and lead them through, uh, you know, the tough times. I mean, you just, you look at us, um, you know, like week 11, we're four and seven. And that could have been a, a very big transition. And, you know, the whole thing could have just imploded. But throughout the entire, the, that entire struggle where we lost five of six, you know, Dave was the same, same person every day, wow. you know, came to work, you know, got us, got the guys ready to play, you know, stayed the course. And I think that's something that you look for in a, in a, in a head coach. And, I think he's going to be very successful at it. And Garrett, does he pay rent on time? <laughs> yeah, he's uh, they're phenomenal. They've turned out to become very, very close friends of mine. Good. Yeah, so him and his wife and their kids are um, really, really special people. Um, you know, we have a weird thing here at Guilf where we just kind of are a gravitational force for pretty awesome folks. You know, and they they walked in uh, my office here last May, you know, and we immediately had this extremely deep connection. I mean, mm-hmm. I personally believe that he's going to be a wave of radical change in the NFL. You know, wow. and so his the whole you know him, him and his wife Lizzie are amazing people. Their whole posture towards community and relationships and vocation is something that we haven't seen since like Tony Dungy. Wow. Um, you know, and so I'm really, really, really excited to see the way in which his leadership not only proves to continue to be successful in the different teams that he's with, um, but how it's a, honestly, how it's a catalyst of change in our, in our industry that needs it, you know? So I am like fully supportive and encouraging and like just ecstatic. I'm sad that like they're leaving Tampa because, you know, you know, I'm sad that my friends are going to be gone, but um, you know, it's the, it's what is the calling and it's where they're going to be heading next. And like, we're just super supportive of them and everything that they're going to be doing. Definitely. You guys are great. Thanks so much for your time. This was awesome. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. I told you I could have talked to them for hours. I feel like I, me and Garrett Gilkey need to have like a really good, like Oprah conversation. I feel like I can learn so much from him and I'm so thankful that they opened up to me so much. You know, you saw Ryan Jensen getting emotional talking about his injury, um, having to deal with the front office. And it's so beautiful to see that member of the front office care about somebody as more than just a number, not just on the back of a jersey, but a number on the spreadsheet. I think that that's very important. They're not just transactions, folks. They're real people. Very thankful for their time, Ryan and Garrett. I hope to see them again because we have so much more to talk about. Thanks for tuning in to Short and to the Point, And of course, Philip for all the things he does and me jinxing my intros and outros per usual. But I'm very, very thankful to all of you who are liking and subscribing. If you haven't, please do so and give this a a rating, preferably five stars. I would love you forever. Like I said, I'm reading all of your DMs. I'm reading all of your tweets. I'm so thankful for you guys tuning in week after week. I'm so in love with this podcast and everything that we're doing with it. So thanks for all of that. For producer Philip, this is Jess Kleinschmidt, and I will see you next time. Want even more short and to the point? Follow Jessica at KleinschmidtJD and head over to thecomeback.com and awfulannouncing.com.